In this section, we'll be exploring the brain and its associated structures. The material will be organized around the five secondary vesicles of the embryonic brain, beginning caudally and moving in a rostral direction. We'll begin with the simplest functions in the hindbrain and then progress to the forebrain where we see such complex functions as thought, memory, and emotions. It's the embryonic myelencephalon that becomes the medulla oblongata. It begin, begins at the foramen magnum in the skull and extends for about three centimeters rostrally. It ends at a groove between the medulla and the pons. The most notable features are these pyramids, which are a pair of external ridges on the anterior surface. They contain the gracile and cuneate fasciculi as they continue from the spinal cord towards the brain. Also on the sides, you'll notice two lateral bulges. These are called the olives. All nerve fibers that connect the brain to the spinal cord, both sensory and motor, have to pass through the medulla oblongata. You can see here in this cross section the variety of information that's passing through the medulla oblongata. We'll see the inferior olivary nucleus, which is a relay center for signals that are going to the cerebellum the reticular formation, which is a loose network of nuclei that extend throughout the medulla, pons, and midbrain. They're involved in cardiac, vasomotor, and respiratory control, so they have centers for each. The medulla oblongata has four main centers. The cardiac center is going to adjust the rate and force of heart contractions. The vasomotor center will adjust the blood vessel diameter, and respiratory centers will control the rate and depth of breathing. And then there's reflex centers for coughing, sneezing, gagging, swallowing, vomiting, salivation, sweating, and movements of the tongue and head. So as you can see, the medulla oblongata is the seat of many of our autonomic involuntary functions, ones that keep us alive. It's said to be evolutionarily the oldest portion of the brain because it controls all of the mandatory functions. The metencephalon develops into two adult structures, the pons and the cerebellum. For now, we'll stick with looking at the pons and return to the cerebellum later on. Posteriorly, the pons consists mainly of two pairs of thick stalks called the cerebellar peduncles. They literally anchor the cerebellum to the pons in the brain stem. If we were to look at it in cross-section, we'll see continuations of the previously mentioned reticular formation as well as the lemniscus and tectospinal tract. Again, information that's ascending and descending through the spinal cord will continue from the medulla oblongata into the pons. The anterior half of the pons is dominated by tracts of white matter that include transverse fascicles that cross between the left and the right and connect the two hemispheres of the cerebellum, as well as longitudinal fascicles that carry sensory and motor signals up and down the brainstem. We'll also see that there are several cranial nerves located on the pons. There are sensory roots involving hearing, equilibrium, taste, and facial sensations, as well as motor roles that involve eye movement, facial expressions, chewing, swallowing, urination, and secretion of saliva, as well as tears. Again, in the pons, we'll see more nuclei in the reticular formation that are associated with sleep, respiration, and posture. Each of these roles of the nuclei in the brainstem will become more familiar next semester when we explore each of the different systems separately. As we move more rostrally, we come to the midbrain, shown here in orange. The midbrain is derived from the embryonic region called the mesencephalon. It's a short segment of brainstem that connects the hindbrain in green to the forebrain. It contains the cerebral aqueduct and then continuations of the medial lemniscus as well as the reticular formation. We will also see the motor nuclei of two of the cranial nerves that control eye movement. We'll explore those in more detail shortly.
The tectum is a posterior roof-like part of the midbrain. It's posterior to the cerebral aqueduct. We can see this here. It exhibits four bulges that we call the corpora quadra gemina. The upper pair are called the superior colliculi. The superior colliculi function in visual attention, tracking moving objects, and some reflexes. The lower pair are called the inferior colliculi. The inferior colliculi receive signals from the inner ear and relays them to other parts of the brain, especially the thalamus. Now having the superior and inferior colliculi so close to each other means that we have some comparison of visual and auditory information. This is the region of the brain that causes us to look when we hear something. Anterior to the cerebral aqueduct, the midbrain consists mainly of the cerebral peduncles. We can see these here. The cerebral pink peduncles are two stalks that anchor the cerebrum to the brain stem. They consist of three main components, the tegmentum, the substantia nigra, and the cerebral crus. You can see each of them here the tegmentum, the substantia nigra, and then the cerebral crus. The tegmentum is dominated by the red nucleus. It gets this pink color because it has a very high density of blood vessels. Connections from the red nucleus go to and from the cerebellum and collaborate with the cere cerebellum for fine motor control. The substantia nigra is pigmented with melanin, it really literally means dark gray to black nucleus. It's a motor center that relays inhibitory signals to the thalamus and the basal nuclei. These inhibitory signals prevent unwanted body movement. It's damage to neurons in the substantia nigra that leads to the tremors that are so characteristic of Parkinson's disease. The cerebral crus is a bundle of nerve fibers that connect the cerebrum to the pons and that carries the corticospinal tract. So we've seen it now at all three levels of the brainstem, the reticular formation. So let's take a look at it as a whole. The reticular formation is a loosely organized web of gray matter. It runs vertically through all levels of the brainstem and consists of clusters of gray matter scattered throughout the pons, midbrain, and medulla. It primarily occupies the space between the white fiber tracts and other more distinct brainstem nuclei and has connections with many regions of the cerebrum. There are more than a hundred small neural networks without any distinct boundaries. So understandably, this is why it's a little difficult to understand the anatomy of the reticular formation. The functions of these networks include the following. First, somatic motor control. It adjusts the muscle tension to maintain tone, balance, and posture, especially while we're moving our body, as well as relaying signals from the eyes and ears into the cerebellum. We can integrate their visual, auditory, and balance information. The gaze center allows our eyes to track and fixate on objects and the central pattern generators of the reticular formation are neural pools that produce rhythmic signals to the muscles of breathing and swallowing. The reticular formation is also involved in cardiovascular control. It has cardiac and vasomotor centers in the medulla oblongata. It's involved in pain modulation. It's one of the routes by which pain signals from the lower body reach the cerebral cortex. It's also the origin of descending analgesic pathways that we mentioned when we talked about reticular spinal tracts. These nerve fibers act in the spinal cord to block transmission of pain signals to the brain. The reticular formation is also involved in sleep and consciousness. It has projections to the thalamus and cerebral cortex, which allow it some control over what sensory signals reach the cerebrum and come into our conscious attention. It plays a central role in states of consciousness, such as alertness and sleep. Injury to the reticular formation can result in irreversible coma. Finally, 
the reticular formations involved in habituation. Habituation is the process by which the brain learns to ignore repetitive, inconsequential stimuli. Like, you're not aware of the shirt on your back every moment that it's there. However, if you put on something that had a different feel, you'd be aware of it for a moment, but not forever. This is the habituation process. Now, let's move on to investigate the cerebellum. It's the largest part of the hindbrain and the second largest part of the brain as a whole. It consists of left and right cerebellar hemispheres that are connected to each other by a vermis. Each hemisphere exhibits slender transverse parallel folds called folia. And they're separated by shallow sulci. The cerebellum has a surface cortex that's made up of gray matter and a deeper layer of white matter that's arranged in sort of a tree-like formation. It's called the arbor vitae, meaning the tree of life. Each hemisphere has four masses of gray matter called deep nuclei that are embedded in the white matter. All input to the cerebellum goes to the cortex and all of its output comes from these deep nuclei. Although the cerebellum is only about 10% of the brain's mass, it has about 60% of the neurons of the brain. That's more than a hundred billion neurons. It has tiny, densely spaced granule cells. But more characteristically, it has these large, globose Purkinje cells. The axons of these Purkinje cells travel to the deep nuclei where they synapse on output neurons that issue fibers to the brainstem. The cerebellum is connected to the brainstem by three pairs of cerebellar peduncles. There are inferior peduncles, middle peduncles, and superior peduncles. The inferior peduncles connect the cerebellum to the medulla oblongata. Most spinal input enters the cerebellum through this inferior peduncle. The middle peduncles are connected to the pons. Most input from the rest of the brain enters by way of the middle peduncle. And the superior peduncles are connected to the midbrain. They carry cerebellar output. Prior to the 1970s, we didn't really have a very good understanding of cerebellar functions. In the 70s, we used to think that it was primarily about monitoring muscle contraction and aiding in motor coordination. However, since then, with the advent of great imaging techniques like PET scans, we've been able to understand more about the cerebellar functions. It turns out they're very diverse. If we had to say in a general sense, its biggest role is probably in evaluation of sensory inputs. For example, it's involved in comparing textures without looking at them. If an individual is touching two objects, without looking at them. It's the cerebellar function that allows them to discern the different textures. It can also be involved in spatial perception and the comprehension of different views of 3D objects and our understanding that even though it looks different, it is the same object. The cerebellum is also a timekeeping center. It predicts the movements of objects. Like if you're playing tennis, how fast is that ball traveling and predicting where it's going to be at a certain time. It also helps predict how much the eyes must move in order to compensate for head movements and allow us to remain fixed on an object. It's also been implicated in hearing, our ability to distinguish pitch and discern similar sounding words from each other. People with cerebellar lesions also have difficulty planning and scheduling tasks. They tend to overreact emotionally and have difficulty with impulse control. Many children with attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder have much smaller cerebellums than those that don't have ADHD. Take a moment here to pull out a pen and paper and summarize each of the different regions of the brain that we've explored so far. So far, we've looked at the hindbrain and the midbrain. We have the medulla oblongata. We have the pons. We have the cerebellum. 
The reticular formation is part of each of those. Do your best to fill in as much information about those different adult brain structures and keep track of which embryonic vesicle they're derived from. See what you can do without looking at your notes and then dig a little deeper. Go into your notes, fill in the gaps, close your book again and see if you can pull out that list. See if you can extract it from your brain. Continue this until you understand each of the different regions of the hindbrain and midbrain.